Hello, everybody. This is Marshall Poe. I'm the editor of the NBN. If you're anything like me, you probably understand that the political discourse in our country is broken. We all live in self-curated media bubbles where our own views get reinforced and sometimes radicalized. As a result, our politics are more disconnected and divided than ever. But what if I told you there was a solution? A new politics newsletter called Tangle is just that. Each day, Tangle introduces a topic in the most neutral language possible, then summarizes five or six of the most compelling arguments from the right, left, and center on that topic. Then, the author of the newsletter offers his own take. I found that Tangle exposes me to views I hadn't yet heard and helps me better understand both my own positions and the views of others. Right now, Tangle is offering NBN listeners an exclusive 20% discount when you subscribe for the year. With this discount, it comes out to about $3 a month. That's a great deal for some of the best political content out there. Just go to readtangle.com slash nbn to sign up and claim your deal. That's readtangle.com slash nbn. Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the New Books in History, a channel of the New Books Network. I'm your host, Hans Wagenberg, a historian of Japan at Penn State. Today, we'll be talking to Jeff Hayton about his book, Culture from the Slums, Punk Rock in East and West Germany which came out this, with Oxford this year, in March 2022. With me today is also uh, Dr. Mahon Murphy in Kyoto University, a historian of modern Germany, who has been researching with me our own punk book that is focused on the scene in Kyoto, Japan. Now, Culture from the Slums is a cultural history of punk in Germany. The manuscript tracks the advent and growth of punk in divided Germany during the 1970s and 1980s, and the social and political response to the subculture. These decades witnessed an explosion of alternative cultures across divided Germany, and punk was a critical constituent of this moment. For young Germans at the time, punk appealed to those gravitating towards individual and cultural experimentation rooted in notions of authenticity, and though was considered to be more real and genuine. Punk, however, was a foreign input, and the way Germans in both East and West adapted it to their own local needs, and a diversion yet surprisingly connected history of punk in both Germanys, Tell us much about German history and society in the 1980s. Culture from the Slums makes two broad claims. First, Hayton argues punk was a medium for alternative living and a motor for social change. Much more than simply a waypoint on the narrative of progress that supposedly led from 1968 towards unification and beyond, it was an important social and musical movement. Second, for a comparative analysis of the subculture in East Germany and West Germany, Hayton argues that punk helps explain why West Germany flourished and why East Germany collapsed. Punk by the 80s ceased to be function as, to function as an instrument of the difference in the West as it entered the mainstream. But the German uh, Democratic Republic never was able to control punk. Hayton examines the roles which punk played in German politics, society, and culture, and how German context transformed punk. Put differently, this is a study about punk in Germany and Germany in punk. Culture from the slums suggests the ideas, practices, and communities which came out of punk transforms both German societies along more diverse and ultimately democratic line. The book is an important contribution to the growing scholarship of punk, which so far has been overwhelmingly focused on Anglo-American developments. So, uh, Mahon, maybe you want to take the first question? Okay, Jeff, um, thanks very much for spending time to talk to us today. Um, we'll start off with the very simple questions, but what brought you to the story? I mean... Why punk, apart from any other musical genre, and why Germany in this period? Uh, maybe if you tell us a little something about more about your background uh, as well to help us fill in kind of your interest and how you came to this topic. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks so much for having me, guys, um, just for starters. And thanks for the um, resume of, of, of the book, Ron. Um, yeah, so I've been interested, I guess, in music and German history for um, a while. Um, used to play guitar um, poorly, um, played in a bunch of bands growing up, um, and then um, got interested in um, German history when I um, first started university. And so, um, you know, thinking of, of marrying my interests, um, I wanted to use music, um, which is, I think, so filled with um, the production of meaning and and contestation as a vehicle for studying um, German history. 
Um, but I didn't want to, I guess, write, I suppose, a sort of typical um, music history, or I guess I should say more popular music history. Um, in other words, I didn't want to write, you know, a book about boys and bands, uh, basically. Um, I wanted to be able to use music to explore um, politics, society, culture, um, etc. Right. So my focus, um, I'm a German historian. Um, my focus, I hope that I achieved this, was trying to elucidate how, um, in this case, punk was this vehicle. Um, for German history. And I was attracted to this moment in the kind of late 1970s, especially, and that's, of course, what brought me to punk. Um, I'm not necessarily a punk fan per se. I like lots of punk music, but I like lots of other, you know, type of music as well. Um, but what brought me to this moment in the 1970s is that this was a period, I think, and this is what I argue in the book, um, was very conducive to challenging um, kind of normative concerns um, in this kind of post-60s period in which a lot of the status quo uh, in both East and West uh, was put into question. And so this seemed like a really, um, and, you know, I think it's an evidence by all the growth of the kind of alternative culture movements, which emerged in this period, um, that this was a moment in which all sorts of future potentialities um, had opportunities to be pursued and some realized um, not all, but but some. And and I think that punk was a really important part of this. And so that's sort of what I was, uh, what brought me to this, um, this topic and um, what I hope that I kind of accomplished with it. Thanks. I want to uh, start, if I can just jump, uh, jump in. I want to, I want to start with your, with your title, right? Which is uh, pretty intriguing. Right, uh, you call a title "Culture from the Slums." It comes from uh, 1978. I mean, the book you, you write about comes from 1978. Um, uh, title of an article in Der Spiegel, uh, which the title is a uh, "Punk Culture from the Slums: Brutal and Ugly." I try not to mess up the German. A uh, punk culture of the slums, brutal and harshlich. Um, could you tell more about the title? I mean, I was really intrigued. It's it's a great title, uh, and uh, maybe you, what does it say about the meaning of punk in Germany in 1978? In particular historical moment. Yeah, I kind of went back and forth on this title a little bit, um, and I'll explain why. Um, in the first place, I think that, um, so for starters, slums, I think, are um, very interesting to think about. And what they mean, how they are constructed, um, deployed, um, and here I mean less sort of physically as more um, mentally. And um, because they, there's all sorts of connotations which are, of course, associated with slums, uh, margins, marginality, uh, borders, uh, specific spaces, uh, inequalities, etc. cetera. And, um, and so that's, you know, on the one hand, that's, what Der Spiegel is playing on. And this was an article that appeared in early 1978 that um, was a very famous article um, within the punk scene and I guess a bit more broadly. Um, it's hard to kind of track how much of an impact that had, but certainly within the punk scene, this was a quite um, provocative article uh, that resonated with um, with the subculture, um, because here was Der Spiegel, which is you know a liberal magazine, uh, you know huge publication in Germany, um, that was trying to make sense of what was happening or had happened, I guess, in Britain 
um, because by 1978, punk is a little bit over in Britain, or at least the first wave is over. Um, and in the article, they were talking about how it is, punk that is, is sort of about to arrive in Germany. And this, you know, this article and its kind of connotations, um, this is sort of this long tradition of, of commenting on um, Anglo-American culture and coming to the continent um, and plays up all sorts of um, older references like jazz and rock and roll. Uh, but what's really interesting is that some of the protagonists who I talked to in the course of this project, um, they repeatedly, this is multiple people who, you know, I didn't had no contact with one another, multiple people, when I told them that this was going to be the title, immediately said that there was no slums in Germany. And, um, and yet here, of course, Der Spiegel is mobilizing this term um, and whether or not there are slums in Germany, I think that's up for debate. Um, but nonetheless, there's this whole host of connotations. And punks too sort of gravitated to this idea of marginality. And this is, I think, a, a important through line throughout the book, um, which sort of speaks to, on the one hand, their consciousness of what they were trying to do, so their intervention um, in society. And it also speaks to, I suppose, the malleability of culture and the ways in which um, sort of uh, foreign or imported um traces um, can be, I guess, repurposed uh, for a variety of, of different reasons. So this article, this title, I think speaks to um, this sort of incredibly complex uh, intersection, uh, which was taking place at the end of the 1970s um, in, in Germany as punk is um, arriving even though, as I said, in Britain, it's maybe already um, gone uh, by this time. Although that, of course, is also up for um, a lot of debate. Yeah, punk was dead on arrival <laughs> for many people, yet he never actually died. Um, yeah, let's not... Yeah, in terms of course, it's... Uh... Yeah, sorry, Mohan. Let's get a long debate about how alive or dead punk is, but you make an interesting point just there. I also think about this idea you talk in your book about how some of the people you talk to, especially the original participants, who are very few, but of course, punk becomes then this part of kind of a social milieu, as you say in the book. And can you tell us a bit about the mass appeal of punk? I mean, it's already been discussed in Der Spiegel in 1978, but as it goes through the 80s, of course, it becomes much more very much ingrained in German popular music culture. So how does this kind of mass appeal of punk interact with the very sticky issue of authenticity that the original punks are talking about? And maybe the use of singing in the German language or something is an important point here. Yeah, um, that is an interesting thing that I sort of encountered very early on because, of course, you know, I'm coming at this project from 30, 40 years later. And so um, the um, sort of echo of what had happened originally in the late 70s um, has grown to um, a very outsized influence or impact compared to what was happening um, at the time. Um, as you say, Mahone, there, there, there was a very, very small number of people involved um, in both East and West. Um, it's, you know, it's difficult, of course, to pinpoint exactly um, how many people we're talking about. Um, it depends on, you know, what you sort of qualify or, or define as being part of uh, the subculture. Um, but the 
impact which punk has uh, had at the time and then later, um, just by looking at the Spiegel article, um, has been much, much bigger uh, than sort of raw numbers. And that that sort of, you know, mass appeal um, is really interesting um, because it sort of speaks to this kind of past um, moment uh, in which people who, you know, weren't involved in any sort of form at the time um, could look back and say, yes, this was a part of um, my history um, and is a part of my identity. And I think, uh, and this is what um, you were referencing, Mahone, is the idea of singing in German, I think, is an important part here. Um, uh, punks uh, in the late 1970s um, were some of the first bands um, to start singing uh, their lyrics in German. Um, since the Second World War, um, German in popular music, uh, mostly, I'll qualify that for a second, but mostly had sang um, in English. Um, this was kind of a repudiation of, of the perceived nationalism of the German language, um, at least initially. And then later on, certainly in the 60s, this was part of this um, transnational youth culture um, was to sing in English um, and to associate German popular music with, with Anglo-American, um, the Anglo-American um, music culture. And so for a long time, most German bands, uh, rock bands, um, didn't um, sing in German. Now, there was a couple of exceptions, important exceptions. Um, Tonstein Sherman was one. Um, Kraftwerk was another. Um, Udo Lindenberg. Um, but generally speaking, um, uh, German bands didn't sing in, in German. And so German punk started to, um, as part of their efforts at experimenting um, with music. And, um, and the initial wave of German uh, punk albums, which came out at the very end of the 1970s, and the very first years of the 1980s, um, these were incredibly important in influencing the next generation of popular music making uh, in especially West Germany and I think directly led to um, the Neue Deutsche Welle, which was this kind of um, German new wave genre of the early 1980s, um, which was enormously popular and essentially um, sort of roughly made it okay to sing in German. And, and so, you know, those fans and those um, audiences who, you know, kind of maybe missed punk um, because it was basically happening in one bar in one city um, for a few months, um, they could, who did experience the Neue Deutsche Welle later, could look back and see this as part of their um, tradition, this, this history. And so I think that this, what this mass appeal speaks to is how punk provides um, individuals with kind of alternative itineraries um, to the future. And, and, and that's why um, punk, even though only a very few people were involved with the production of the music and the, and the fashion and the, and the scene, um, could speak to um, a much broader audience. Oh, yeah, thank you. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I wanna, can I pick up on this thread of, of singing German to go back a little bit to, to the German issue? Because, of course, uh, the reason why German, the language, is problematic is because of the, because of the, because of national socialism, right? And the image of German and the use of music by national socialism. Uh, but the punks actually really used it uh, to really um, punks being punks uh, 
use it in a very productive way. And you open uh, you opened uh, chapter one uh, with this very productive account by Marilu uh, Monroe, uh, Franz uh, Billmeier, of his impression of the first concert he saw, I think it's The Clash and uh, The Damned in 1977. And he said, and it was... Uh, his quote is like he said that uh, the concert was indescribable, an orgy, and not since the thousand year Reich have people been so carried away. Uh, what does it quote say? What does it what does it mean in this particular historical context? And really, also, if you want to talk, I want to talk a little bit more not just about the connection to national socialism, but also about the whole idea of a punk travelogue, and what does it tell us about the way youths and in, in West Germany, East Germany, adapted to the sound of punk in this particular moment. Yeah. um, Fascism, I think, is a kind of critical reference point um, for punk and, of course, for all of German history after 1945. Um, That I don't think is particularly controversial. Um, And punks, as you say, Ron, um, sort of engaged with fascism in very productive ways in, and in a variety of different ways, um, I believe. Um, there was, as I say in the book, this uh, a tremendous amount of flirtation with fascism. Um, and this is part of punk's sort of pursuit of provocation. Um, on the one hand, um, people like Monroe, um, they used fascism to um, needle uh, the alternative left and to provoke sort of outrageous responses from um, from the 68ers, who, of course, um, were much more earnest, I guess, in their um, condemnations of fascism. Um, and um, But this provocation, it was always this very fine line, um, which someone like Monroe here, for example, um, embodies in this line in which he's sort of comparing the um, Clash concert to... Um, the sort of ecstatic experience of national socialism. And there's a lot of this that runs through punk in the early years. Um, And people were never quite 100% sure how serious or how unserious punks were with this flirtations. Um, um, Dea F, uh, Deutsche Amerikanische Freundschaft, this is a really important band um, in the late 70s, early 1980s, they played with this kind of fascist aesthetic um, tremendously um, with a number of their songs, like Der Mussolini, um, which had all sorts of lyrics associating um, Hitler and Jesus together, which um, people were offended by. Uh, but at the same time, of course, their name, DAF, this is the um, acronym for the Nazi labor union. Um, they dressed in this kind of Nazi chic, um, leather, sweating muscles aesthetic. And so one was never quite sure how serious or how unserious, um, punks were when it came to, um, when it came to their flirtations with fascism. Um, probably, at least for me at any ways, the person who made the most sense in trying to figure out this conundrum um, was uh, an artist, Moritz R., who was um, a member of Der Plan. And he, he talked about how in the late 1970s that um, for him, um, and he said this multiple times in a lot of different ways, he said, everything felt so unfree back then. And what he meant by this was that as a result of the sort of political dogma of the alternative left of the 68ers and that generation who condemned 
any sort of um, backsliding, conservative backsliding or something like that, that these strictures closed off uh, experimentation. And so he has this funny quote that I, I quote in the book where he talks about, um, I can't remember the quote exactly, but he says something like, you know, if you said you liked high rise apartment buildings uh, or I don't know, concrete parking lots, you were considered a fascist. You were considered a real reactionary. And he said he wanted freedom. And so he used fascism. He says, he says at one point, um, the quote is something like, um, jokes about Jews were taboo. And so he used these, this flirtation as a means of achieving freedom. And, um, and these were, I think, important interventions at a time when um, fascism and the experience of national socialism was just sort of coming into um, tremendous public discussion. Um, the Holocaust miniseries had just occurred. And, um, and as um, Gabby Delgado Lopez, he was a singer for DAF, he said um, about the song de Mussolini, um, he said that, um, that by associating Hitler with Jesus, that what the band was trying to do was to demystify, um, in essence, German history and to make it safe for discussion. And so I think that this sort of intervention, um, public intervention about fascism engaged with by uh, punk was an important part and basically as yet unnoticed part of, of German dealing with the past um, at this kind of critical moment in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, when these discussions um, were, were appearing all over the place. Yeah, 1978 is, of course, the moment where the Holocaust, the TV, the TV series showed, and that's where, so you have this rise in Holocaust consciousness, a very international rise of Holocaust consciousness, and a rise of punk at the same time, and it's, those are really, um, you know, it's very interesting uh, crossovers you have there. Another thing that I should uh, point out, and Mahon, maybe you can elaborate more, is the fact that both Del Plan and the DIF were very popular in Japan. Right, Mahon? Yeah, um, they were certainly, the DF had planned to come tour Japan in 82, got cancelled, but their plan had been over and back to Japan quite a few times. Um, and Japan also has its same kind of use of Nazi imagery in its punk, in its punk music, maybe more, of course, copying the UK style of just using it for shock value, which I think is maybe one way of transfers to, to Germany. Maybe it ties into another question I'd like to ask as well is, because Punk has this kind of very hyper-masculine image. I think that's where the kind of fascism aspect of it also plays into. Um, but you write a lot of the social composition to punks, especially its gender aspect, which are quite thorny issues. And maybe you might make some comments on the of gender in punk, which is something we're working on as well in our own work. Maybe the differences between gender and punk in the East German and West German cases might be a good um, way to analyze this gender aspect. Yeah, um, a thorny issue for sure. Um, yeah, I think that they're, the first thing I think that in trying to sort of sort this um, problematic out is certainly um, for me, I'm not sure um, how you guys are finding this in Japan, but certainly for me, um, when it comes to sort of elaborating the kind of social dimensions of the subculture, you immediately kind of run into the problem of, of having no sort of hard numbers um, about what it is that you are um, talking about. Um, mm. I use terms of sources. I used um, for, for the West, um, popular press was important. Um, lots of articles and comments about punk in various ways. Um, sometimes we get numbers in them, um, especially if some sort of event occurs in which people get arrested. Um, and that kind of allows for some sort of rudimentary elaboration. 
Um, and in the East, um, not a lot of newspaper commentary, but um, state files, especially from the secret police, that allows for some guesswork about the size and social composition of the sum culture. But again, this is your kind of, in a certain way, you're, you're um, held hostage to your sources. Um, I have no idea how the secret police, the Stasi, um, counted punks. Um, and so if they say there was 400 punks in Leipzig, I don't know what their methodology or criteria is for making that assessment, right? Was it, I don't know, hairstyle or something? But even then, um, this is sort of problematic. So in the first instance, when trying to sort of think about this, and I'd be interested to hear how you guys are are sorting this out, um, is a lack of numbers. Um, having said all that, I do make some claims about about the social composition of punk in 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 Germany. On the one hand, um, it's certainly a lot more diverse, I would say, than the sort of stereotypical um, um, idea that punk is a kind of proletarian um, subculture, um, which you know is is basically stems back from the nineteen seventies um, social scientist work, um, and um, and certain city scenes um, were much different from one another um, in Germany. And that's an important sort of element of, of German punk is that Hamburg punk was much different from Dusseldorf punk, which was much different from West Berlin punk. And each of these city scenes kind of developed somewhat independently of themselves um, for a couple of years before around 1979, um, when a series of, of events sort of nationalize um, the subculture and these different city scenes start to come into contact with one another and start to sort of sort out uh, what is real punk. Um, but we see in places like Dusseldorf, for example, this is a very uh, middle-class scene. Lots of art students, um, lots of students, uh, sorry, lots of kids coming from the suburbs who come into Dusseldorf. Um, and that's much different from, say, Hamburg, which is a lot more, um, I would say, working class. And, um, and in terms of gender, um, there's kind of a similar uh, mappings in which the more middle class the scene, it seems there's more gender diversity. Um, and the more diversity in a scene also seems to correlate to um, more experimentation when it comes to um, music. And so places like Dusseldorf and West Berlin, for example, they were the, probably the most experimental and they were also, I think, the most diverse. And punk, um, on the one hand, well, I think that there was um, tremendous sort of opportunities for women to become involved in a music industry, music culture, which until then was very um, masculine, dominated by men. Um, I think that punk gave women a tremendous amount of opportunities, both in terms of sort of the content of, of you know, music making or organizing shows, um, playing instruments, songwriting, um, which is an incredibly important um, development here for the German music industry just in general. At the same time, um, it's... Um, just as in Britain, as America, as basically the world over, um, the punk song culture is uh, overwhelmingly male. Um, even if, as the example of Monroe um, suggests, um, Franz Bielemeyer, um, he took the, his nom de guerre, uh, Mary Lou Monroe, um, and as that name suggests, there was uh, a considerable amount of fluidity when it came to 
um, sort of what it meant to be masculine um, in in the punk subculture, right? So on the one hand, you had groups like DAF who were playing up this kind of hyper-masculine, um, almost to the point of parody. And on the other hand, you had a um, tremendous amount of fluidity. So uh, this isn't a very good answer, but um, this, this sort of... It, Punk was, was incredibly, I think, complex and naughty when it comes to sort of figuring out um, who was a part of it, what did the subculture look like, and then especially flowing from that is uh, sort of exploring the consequences of that. And I think that that's a, a super important, difficult task. Um, and I think that as each sort of book on punk comes out, we get more or uh, closer and closer, I would say. Um, to sort of thinking about, um, thinking through these problems. Yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, if I can maybe just uh, jump in, like answer a question about what we found, and maybe Mahoney can also jump in, because a lot of it got to do with the archives. You're perfectly, in Japan as well, uh, the way that gender and class intersects are very important. And like we found, what you found about class, working class versus a middle class punks, it's, uh, I think correlates to what we found. We solved the problem of numbers by looking at one city, right? So it's much easier for us to estimate. But even that, it's it's really hard because of the nature of the archives or, or the lack of archives, actually, that we have, right? So uh, in, our, in, in our case, uh, we have an estimate of how many people were part of the scene, but it's really, really hard. Right, Mahon? Yeah, we're talking small numbers as well. In a city of, what, 1 million people, we're talking about full-time punks, maybe 100, 200. That'd be a generous estimate. Yeah, and but, and how, are you, yeah. how are you identifying them as punks? This is the key question. Uh, it's well, we based on people... self-identification. Yeah. Yes, that is the key thing, yeah. If they, if they call themselves, and it's very fluid, and we talk about kids, right? Most, I mean, I mean, young people who who move uh, between identities and musical scene, and specifically, and in our part, and I don't want to get too much into our work, but uh, when you move from uh, punk to new wave to noise, it's very fluid. So um, we need to keep our 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 borders Maybe fluid. That, and that's what, something that you bring out your book, Jeff. I think as well the the, the life cycle of punks as well. I mean for Kyoto seemed like the punk band's a typical life cycle is three years maximum. And then there's either quit the band or do something different or leave the scene or move into some other part of the scene. But you seem to show a bit more of a long-term game with the German punks, if that's, if that's the right word to use. They seem to be in a yeah, think long haul. It's, yeah, I think there's, there's a certain segment or long haulers who are there for life. And then there's this constant rotation of younger people. Yeah. Yeah, and, and jumping ahead, this actually relates to something that's very important for us also, which is, and you already mentioned the 68. Uh, you mentioned 68ers as an enemy, quote unquote, or as a, as a rival. Maybe you can elaborate more, more on this. Uh, at what role did the hippies uh, play? They're very important in, in, our, in our research, but, and, but also I want to hear about your, 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 the, the place of those people in your research. Yeah, they, they, they are portrayed as enemies um, by punks. Um, although I think as I show in my book, I think that we kind of want to question this a little bit. Um, on the one hand, yeah, the punks, part of their sort of self-construction is to contrast themselves with um, the previous generation, the 60s generation, hippies, 68ers in Germany. And part of their sort of um, rebellion, um, in fact, I argue, um, isn't so much against um, society in general as it is against um, this particular generation, who in many ways are their sort of older brothers and sisters. Um, Punks are were too young, basically, to have experienced the late 60s, but they, of course, grew up in the shadow of, of the 60s. And so, um, so 
hippies are uh, essentially an, uh, a useful mirror um, in the construction of themselves. And they sort of reject basically everything that, that hippies supposedly stand for en route to the creation of their own identities and culture. Um, at the same time, as I think I show, uh, there, there's just a tremendous amount of continuity um, between this earlier generation and punks. And in a sort of strange and weird way, um, punks are uh, uh, certainly in certain ways, not in every way, but in certain ways are in some ways the, the sort of fulfillment of many of the goals of the 1960s, even if they sort of, you know, pursued those routes um, in different ways. Um, I think the do-it-yourself activism and and endeavor that, that is such an important part of, of punk culture from, you know, the creation of media to, to music to clubs, et cetera, um, all of that um, has uh, tremendous um, continuities with, with the 60s generation. Um, and even just in general, the politics of, of punks um, in terms of the sort of creation of an acceptance of difference and alternativeness um, is an important continuity um, as well. Um, and it's not just sort of the goals, I would say, um, that speak to these this longstanding traditions, but also in many cases, personnel. Um, there was a number of individuals who were active in the late 60s or early 70s who would be, you know, consider themselves or who did consider themselves as part of the alternative milieu, um, the alternative left, um, which punks were ostensibly against, who continued their work um, with punk. Um, probably the foremost figure here is a man named Alfred Hillsberg, who was... Um, incredibly important journalist, concert organizer, um, a label boss, who put out hundreds of uh, punk albums with his ZigZag um, record label, and who also uh, was, wrote incredibly important um, um, uh, magazine articles um, for the main um, German music magazine, Sounds, which sort of spoke to this national punk subculture as a way of developing uh, developing a kind of authentic German popular culture for the first time, and through his concert organization. Um, he staged a whole series of national concerts, festivals, in 1979, which really sort of uh, is what brought the different city scenes together um, for the first time. And he, you know, he had been um, involved with kraut rock back in the late 60s um, and, um, and, and, and was, you know, a hippie basically and, and saw in punk a continuation of, of um, what he said at one point um, was um, the sort of fulfillment of what Germans had missed um, with Elvis and, Be- and the Beatles, basically that um, punk was the opportunity to create this national culture. And, and so he sort of continued this in, um, with his uh, punk endeavors and still continues to this day. Uh, he still runs his record labels and, and puts out um, experimental music um, 50 years later. Great. That's a, a great point to, to come in on then. Um, the, um, talk about kind of creating a German national culture. But of course, you're talking about a divided Germany in your book. And in chapters four and five, I think you, you discuss these challenges faced by the punks on either side of the east-west divide. And um, quite surprisingly, the, how the Federal Republic was quite repressive of punks. It was something that came to me as being unexpected, I think. Um, obviously, can you expect the repression to be there in the GDR? But can you tell us a little bit about this differences and similarities between the punks scenes in both parts of eastern of both both parts of the of Germany basically yeah i i i had um so i i expected to um find significant differences as you said mo this this um you know i thought that sort of going into this i would find certain things in 
in um, on one side and certain things on the other. And so I was surprised at all of the kind of similarities um, in the ways in which punk, I guess, resonated in both societies and um, and the solutions to punk um, that emerged in both East and, um, and West. Um, as you said, um, we see, I think, oppression on both sides, or at least misunderstandings, maybe. Um, in East Germany, um, punks, uh, well, the East German state at first didn't really know what to do with punk, um, for a couple of years, it kind of insisted, state officials insisted that punk didn't exist in East Germany. Um, but by about kind of 82, 83, um, punks were, um, had become quite public. Um, they were staging concerts. They were giving interviews in the West to Western newspapers. And, um, and so at this point, um, the state government, uh, secret police um, came down hard on the subculture and um, and basically um, shattered the kind of first generation of East German punks. Um, and so that was a bit expected. Um, but in the West, kind of a sort of, not exactly the same, but a similar result occurred as well, is that as, um, as punk, um, or at least one wing of punk, Um, became uh, a lot more harder, a lot more violence prone. Um, This group um, came into tremendous amount of conflict with um, state and society. And um, and we find um, a lot of sort of explosive moments um, between kind of police and state officials and punks, Um, you know, so punk gathering in public spaces become very contested in which we have, you know, basically business owners, um, you know, um, convincing city governments to, to pass ordinances to eject these youths from public spaces because it's, you know, disrupting their business. Um, we see efforts by German police to arrest and, and um, to monitor punk concerts um, and, um, and, and this kind of, um, this evidence is spotty because these, um, files in the archives are just being released right now. So, um, what I was able to find was surprising at the amount of interest, um, police and state authorities in West Germany took, um, uh, over punk, and I think that we're going to find a whole lot more of that as as more um, information comes out. Um, and at the same time, uh, we see a tremendous amount of similarities with the ways in which punk becomes um, co-opted um, in both East and West, um, although in different ways. Um, in the West, this is mostly done through um, the music industry. Um, after the kind of initial run of punk um, album subculture um, and these sort of originals kind of wrapped themselves up kind of around 90, 81 or so, 82, this second wave of um, popular German um, artists who became part of the Neue Deutsche Welle, um, the music industry um, went to town with them. And we're able to essentially mainstream uh, what had once been punk and sort of by the end, kind of, you know, 84, 85 had become its own sort of genre, this this new German wave. Um, and so we see that um, happening in, in, um, in the West. And in the East, this co-optation um, involves um, the state in which the state um, sort of by about 1986, decides that its coercive policies vis-a-vis punk weren't working, that in fact it was only making punk more popular, um, especially as punks were um, sort of um, becoming integrated into the Protestant churches. And so they do this reversal, and they start to at first tentatively um, 
uh, sort of support punk on the radio, um, and then um, full-fledgedly in 1988, and start recording punk bands, etc. And this, of course, required all sorts of, um, I think, um, certainly what people at the time called compromises um, and hard questions about um, um, being involved in a um, dictatorial state, right? Can you critique it while at the same time um, playing in, you know, state youth houses, even getting a salary, state salary, um, if you were involved in the um, state music industry? And so what these kind of similarities and differences speak to, I think, is that punk is, um, at least for Germany, seems to be less a critique of a specific political ideology or, you know, economics or, or society, perhaps, than a sort of civilizational critique or, or a, a critique of modernity in its various ways. Um, which manifest themselves on both sides of the Iron Curtain. And I think that that's kind of pretty interesting sort of conclusion to come to from, um, from this comparison. Wonderful. Thank you. And you bring us some interesting things, fascinating things in the book that I, I encourage people who are listening to go and get a copy. Um, the discussion between the alliance between the punks in East Germany and the uh, present churches is makes for fascinating reading but we'll move on to to ran you've got a question you want to ask so i'll leave you ask the next one yeah that's it's like the uh, well when you get to when you got a punk i mean it's a question that we dealt with uh, since we were kids authenticity right i mean what makes a punk a punk and who's a sellout because this is again a question as old as punk itself which was for many people it was dead by 78 for others it continued on and you can see it play all both in East and West. I mean, when you start showing having shows in churches, I mean, right? It's like and then having church having shows sponsored by the Communist Party. Uh, you know we're, we're, how authentic you are, and like you see it. Uh, I think in the West, I guess it's it's a much more important. And correct me if I'm wrong. Much more important discussion when you saw the rifts between the original parks and uh, New Wave, uh, and then. The hardcore versus Kunstpunk or fun punk. Uh, what was it really more important in the West and the East, and what what role does it play? Because this is a big, big uh, issue that we uh, punks deal with in our research as well. The issue of what's authentic punk, what's authenticity, who's a sellout, and the like. Yeah, I think I I don't know if it was more important, but it was more commented upon and more discussed. And that's simply a question of sources. Is that we're so reliant when it comes to East Germany, we're so reliant on what other people were writing about punks um, that there isn't the same kind of dialogue which we get in the West. So I don't know if it was more important in West and East, but certainly people were talking about it more in the West. Um, as you say, Rad, huge, this is a huge, of course, topic, uh, endless topic, if you will, in music more generally. Um, is a question of authenticity and and certainly um, in some ways um, is, is the defining question when it comes to punk and um, and I you know I don't really try to solve it or anything um, so much as I try to sort of um, point to the ways in which um, people talked about it um, throughout the book and, um, and a couple of sort of interesting things, I guess, emerged from me kind of thinking about authenticity and the ways in which it's deployed in debates about punk and, um, and, and the ways in which um, sort of East and West wrestle with this issue. On the one hand, you know, authenticity is, um, it's relying on experts. Um, it's reliant on people who can speak to uh, what is or isn't. And, um, and Ran, you asked a question a while ago about the travel logs, and these were an important um, um, sort of source of dissemination for punk early on. Um, it, one of the things to remember is that for Germans in, like, say, 76, 77, um, 
punk, you couldn't experience punk um, unless you went to Britain. You basically couldn't hear it on the radio because nobody had recorded anything until late 77. And so you could just get these kind of snippets via text and images, which is a kind of really interesting way to think about the dissemination of music. And that probably is the same for you in Japan as well. And so there's this kind of lag in, in which music is constructed non-sonically. And so what that means is you're reliant on experts to tell you what is and isn't punk. And so for me, one of the really helpful ways of thinking about authenticity is that it's a regime of truth, a regime in which people, experts, are able to make decisions about, you know, practices or ideas or whatever, what counts and what doesn't. And you see this in all sorts of different ways, ways I didn't, you know, I could have, you know, endlessly written about this. Um, But you had, for instance, you know, in fanzines, you would have, you know, these lists of like, you know, this is correct punk leather jacket and this is an incorrect leather jacket. You know, you have to stand in a certain way. You have to smoke your cigarette in a certain way. All this kind of stuff in which people are sort of policing the boundaries of the subculture. And it's essentially an insolvable paradox um, of trying to sort of get at this, um, you know, eternal truth. And yet um, subcultures like punk spend just an extraordinary amount of time um, devoted to this paradox. Um, and in the end, you're left with, um, if punk is about experimentation, if punk is about difference, if punk is about alternatives, um, you know, how far can you go before it's no longer punk? And this kind of, you know, as I say, this paradox just sits in punk constantly. Um, and, and one of the things, though, that's interesting about authenticity uh, as it played out in German punk scenes in East and West is that, um, you know, there's this constant awareness in the West, at least as it appears in the sources, fanzines and music articles and interviews and all this kind of stuff, at least in the West, it's, uh, there's this constant awareness that, um, that punk is, is dead or dying or being lost um, and this kind of, on the one hand, you know, urge to sort of engage in practices, et cetera, which can keep it alive while at the same time acknowledging that the moment has passed. Um, and so there's this sort of, you know, pessimistic, optimistic, et cetera, swing that goes back and forth constantly. And, um, and in the East, as I said, we don't have... Uh, you know, we don't know the discussions that people had, unfortunately. Um, you know, in a certain way, I kind of wish that the Stasi was a bit more effective and had been recording uh, more conversations um, that, so that we might be able to retrieve these kinds of discussions. Um, but, um, you know, uh, we don't know how Easterners debated this. Um, but there's a really interesting quote by a guy who he wrote a memoir recently about being a punk in Halle um, and growing up in the 1980s. And he, he has this really interesting quote, um, interesting for me at any rate, where he says, and I'm just kind of paraphrasing it here. He says something like, um, you know, we were persecuted, we were oppressed, we were jailed. Um, but we were freer than everyone else. And that quote, um, for me, is probably the most important way of thinking about punk in East Germany, or punk in a dictatorship more generally, is that, um, in fact, oppression and persecution made their experiences in a certain way more real. And it allowed them to stave off those sort of, I guess you could call them systematic or structural processes, music industry, for example, which were 
in other places, democratic places, um, part of the erasure of authenticity, of co-optation, of mainstreaming. And so I think that you could sort of make an argument, and I sort of tentatively do, although of course recognizing that authenticity is, is in many ways completely constructed, is that perhaps authenticity was experienced or felt by East German punks longer than West German punks. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And I, I recognize this. Uh, uh, I had just a conversation last week in Tokyo with uh, someone who's working with punks in Myanmar and in Indonesia where there's oppression, um, state oppression. And um, yeah, there was almost the envy, envy at the fact that they have, quote unquote, a real struggle. Um, and they're more they're more real as punks. As, um, one thing that um, yeah, we're we're getting to an end, but um, one thing that also, if coming from Japan, like one thing that enable the move away beyond punk in Japan, and I think that's what we see in R is the fact the example of German punk actually the, uh, the fact that bands like their plan and they were more experimental actually enabled legitimize a move towards more experimental um, sorts of music, I think. Uh, Mohan, do you want to add something? No, I think we, we've, we've, we've borrowed enough of Jeff's time at the moment. And I just to add that I think I fully recommend the book. It's a fascinating read and it really added a lot to my own knowledge of what I thought I knew about German punk. Um, I know a lot more now and it's, it's really yeah, excited me and to works into my own research as well. Yeah, before we end, Jeff, we want to ask, uh, what's next for you? I mean, you finished a book. What's What are you working on now? What's your next research plan? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not writing about punk anymore. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm actually in Germany right now, in Germany for, for a year, um, doing research on um, my next project, which is a book, um, it's called Socialist Summits, Mountains and Mountaineering in um, the GDR. It's a, it's, a, it's a book about the kind of role and the place of mountains uh, in socialism. So it's, uh, I guess, a much different project than, um, than, than punks, although there is a lot of kind of, Mm, there's some similarities here as well in this kind of, I don't know if you guys know anything about uh, mountain climbing and mountaineering is that, you know, one of the sort of big motivations for climbing mountains um, is a lot, uh, it's a lot of it's related to kind of individuality and, and kind of overcoming individual, you know, fears and, 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 um, you know, trying to achieve and all that kind of stuff. And that, of course, is um, this sort of pursuit of individuality um, was an important part of punk. Um, and, of course, is at least theoretically um, not supposed to exist under socialism. And so, um, so this, so one of the sort of thread lines running from punk to this new study is, is this continued kind of engagement with um with thinking about individualism uh, under socialism. Yeah, there's a, I I forgot the the name of the article. There was someone who, um, I think it's a book you uh, you reviewed, is someone who compare a hiking movement in in, in, uh, pre-World War Germany and and punks. Uh, I forgot the name of the article, but I can definitely see the, (laughs) I can see the parallels here. So, uh, so uh, yeah, thank you, uh, both of you. Thank you, um, Mahon. Thank you, Jeff, for this uh, really fascinating talk. We learned a lot. I was taking my notes furiously as you talked, Jeff. And uh, I'm looking forward to reading the next book. Great. Thank you guys so much.